Hello, welcome to the Harry Glorikian Show, where we dive into the tech-driven future of healthcare. It seems clear that generative AI is going to change how we do things across the entire economy, including the fields we talk about here on the show, namely healthcare delivery, drug discovery, and drug development. But we're still just starting to figure out exactly how it's going to change things. For example, AI is already speeding up the process of discovering new biological targets for drugs and designing molecules to hit those targets. But whether that will actually lead to better medicines or create new generation of AI-driven pharmaceutical companies are still unanswered questions. One thing that's for sure is that generative AI isn't magic. You can't just sprinkle it like pixie dust over an existing project or data set and expect wonderful things to happen automatically. In fact, just to use the data you already have, you have to start to train a generative model. You may have to invest a lot in new infrastructure and tools. And that's the part of the puzzle we're going to focus on today. My guest is David Bunyatyan. He's the founder of a company called Active Loop, which is trying to address the need for infrastructure capable of handling large-scale data for AI applications. David has a background in neuroscience from Princeton University, where he was part of a team working on reconstructing neural connectivity in mouse brains using petabyte-scale imaging data. At Active Loop, David has led the development of Deep Lake, a database optimized for AI and deep learning models trained on equally large data sets. Deep Lake manages data in a tensor native format, allowing for faster iterations when training generative models. David says the company's goal is to take over the boring stuff. That means removing the burden of data management from scientists and engineers so they can focus on the bigger questions, like making sure their models are training on the right data and ultimately innovate faster. There's a lot of technical details in this conversation, but sometimes it can be really helpful to get down into the weeds, and that was definitely the case with David. So here's our full interview. David, welcome to the show. Um, thanks for having me, Harry. Great to have the conversation. Looking forward to it. So um, I'm excited to have you on here. I mean, you are, I have to, you know, compared to like the vast majority of people I talk to, like you're way more on the data science side than say, you know, the, the patient care or actually working on the drugs. But I think it's, it's an important topic because the one without the other doesn't get you to that end point. And I want to start off and, and, and just sort of uh, set the stage because I was like trying to read up as much as I could on the company and what you're doing. And one of the points you guys make or the contentions is that um, data scientists who want to use machine learning should be free to do what they do best, meaning uh, training models, pushing them into production, shipping new features, and solving core business problems rather than say spending a lot of times building this data infrastructure you know dynamic or data stack right um and i think that's a great insight and before we go into what it takes to build a data infrastructure or how you do that at active loop um maybe we could talk about what it would mean if a data scientist did have access to all this infrastructure, um, especially in the world of healthcare and medicine. So what are the kind of problems um, could healthcare companies say solve if they could apply machine learning to their discovery and development challenges easy, much more easily, let's say, um, and, and maybe run through some of them because I think it would be helpful for the listeners to really understand um, what that means. And, and maybe we could talk about different applications of deep learning or other forms of machine learning that you think are most interesting in drug discovery, cancer detection, brain imaging, you know, surgical assistance, eye disease. I mean, there's, I can think of <laughs> tens of examples of areas where this might be applied. So 
you know, I said a lot there. So, so I'll, I'll let you, you start from there. Before getting and sharing what the company is doing, let me tell you the story, how it actually began before. Okay. Before I started the company, I was doing a PhD at Princeton University in a neuroscience lab, actually. So while we will talk about more about data and AI, et cetera, I think there's some sort of relation to how this all started. It's actually came from biomedical applications. At Princeton Neuroscience Institute, I was at um, um, neuroscience lab where we're trying to reconstruct the connectivity of neurons. So this field is called connectomics. It's a new branch in neuroscience that tries to map all the neural activities and how they connect to each other so that you can come up with more biologically inspired algorithms so that how the learning is happening inside inside to understand better how the learning is happening inside the brain and what we were doing is that we were taking one millimeter cubic volume of a mouse brain cutting into very thin slices each slice was hundred thousand by hundred thousand then imaged with electromicroscopy images. And then we had 20,000 of this. So the data was getting to a petabyte scale. And to imagine what is a petabyte scale is like a thousand times of um, machine data you will have on your laptops so that you can store actually just one cubic millimeter of a mass brain data. And then once those Im images um, you collected and stored it on a cloud, then the problem was to be able to see how each this pixel or voxel is connected to another voxel so then you can anatomically reconstruct the 3d models of each neuron at a synapse level and then build the graph and then also apply um like prior basically taking these images you were also doing some experiment um where the mouse was going like seeing some visual cues and then you are taking this calcium imaging as well and then you connect the neural activities with how they are connected so then you can deduce some patterns what are the like how each neuron affects the other neurons inside the brain and because historically neuroscience was focused on understanding a single cell uh, behavior and then you also have psychology which is doing like high like more functional understanding of how we make decisions but there's a there was a big gap between going from single cell to a like how we make decisions should we start this company or not Anyway, um, and what we realized while this was one of the biggest projects by the IARPA, which is the fund under um, the, I think there was DARPA for the defense part. This was IARPA under intelligence part. And there, it was not only our, our lab, but also there were like M from MIT, from Harvard, from Allen Institute, from other like places as well. And many of them had different approaches how to tackle this problem. However, if you could see is like dealing like petabyte scale data to build like really high precision AI algorithms to be able to process this amount of data, you actually need infrastructure. And what we have faced with is that most of the existing tools at that time, and this was like about six or um, seven years ago, couldn't scale to our needs. Like we had to um, rethink how the distribution of compute processing should happen on the cloud. We have to rethink how the data actually should be stored so that we can move it around. Like um, at that time we were doing, doing all these computations, like a very basic example is like moving a petabyte scale data, let's say from Princeton to, let's say to um, West Coast, like to San Francisco, it's actually will be much cheaper to hire a truck physically load data into this truck and then move it around, then move it over the internet. That's just one example how things break at that scale. And a lot of like toolings, especially in AI and ML as well, like they got inspired from the uh, biomedical use cases. And that's how we started Active Loop later realizing is like processing petabyte scale data on the cloud costs like million dollars, how we can reduce this by five times by rethinking how the data should be stored, how should we stream from the storage to the computing machines, should we use CPUs, GPUs, and what kind of models to use. But the key insight, what I realized is that this infrastructure is actually helps you to cycle through the data much faster. And what you need is like, you need a lot of iterations to be able to come up with um, a quality of an output that can be later used, let's say for neuroscience research, because if you imagine there's like one mistake, one pixel like mistake of correspondence can have a butterfly effect of how this neuron connects to another neuron. And then you can have a failure or like a 
misinterpretation how this neuron was actually connected to another neuron, which was a false positive. So we right. spent a lot of research coming up with the models that can not only like generate or like predict or segment the neuron connectivity, but also can do error correction. Like, and it, it was a big lab. It was not just me. It's like there were like 30 team members led by my advisor, Sebastian Son. And we had also annotators in the lab. And our lab, actually, we I remember one of our um, PhD students, Kisak Lee, he actually came up with the first, one of the first convolutional neural models that can beat the human in annotations. So basically, if you have an human, like a, a, an expert level human who can given electron microscopy images can segment, here's a neuron one, here's a neuron two, we could get new, like first models that can achieve superhuman accuracy, which means they can in average um, behave better than a human expert can do labeling this data. And what this means is that the number of annotators we had in our lab, which like 20 or 30, they transitioned into from annotating all the data that we collected to actually becoming an error correctors so they only there so we took their time and sent them only the data that the model was not confident with right. and started doing these annotations later what happened is that we also trained another model that does the error correction itself and yeah. then the human annotators they also became like the correctors of the error correctors so essentially you took the expertise of these people who actually got very good at labeling um, which neuron correspondence you have for each pixel to become like, as, as the automation was going under the hood, you brought these people at higher level and higher level. And the realization is that you really need like a couple components from for this to really work well is that you need, of course, the GPU computer infrastructure. You, you need the data or the label data by the human experts or the annotators. And um, you also needed the, the researchers to be able to come up with these models. And what I saw there is that this infrastructure and is that so critical to come up with these AI systems that like in, I don't know, next, within five years or 10 years, all the companies will require this. And fortunately, what happened a year ago and a year and a half ago is that OpenAI came in up with um, GPT-4, showed that if you scale the compute, if you scale the data, if you scale the like the like the expertise of humans working on these models, you can achieve like models that are like superhuman or at least can act um, within the same accuracy in some fields um, as as same as as humans as well. So. That's just a brief um, background, but let me know if you have any questions. Happy to deep dive and, and get there. No, I, I just want to get back to like thinking about our, you know, the world that most of the listeners probably think about is, you know, drug discovery, cancer detection, et cetera, is, you know, when you're thinking about the kinds of problems that these companies are solving, um, in these worlds, what do you see as examples of, of what you've encountered? What kind of problems are these clients that are utilizing your platform trying to solve without disclosing anything you know, super confidential? So from our side, when we started the company um, about five years ago, we didn't actually focus on biomedical use cases. We said, okay, we are building a horizontal data platform where um, any company we can help them with managing their data and connect to AI models. And the biggest difference is that what we realized is that you have all these awesome databases, data warehouses, data, data lakes, lake houses, specialized for analytical workloads, but you don't have one for deep learning and AI applications. And we said, okay, why don't we look into this deep learning frameworks, which are under the hood of all these foundational or large language models and say, what is the best way to store the data? Later, while we built all this infrastructure and started onboarding customers, what we realized is that why this resonates well with biomedical um, industry, including life sciences, pharma, healthcare, um, and med tech, is that no one actually came up with a specialized, or not a specialized, like a data management layer that these companies 
can um, take care of. And the reason is that because you have so many formats, how let's say a CT is scanned and stored, like how the MRIs, how the electromicroscopy data, like every of like the vendors who create machines, they came out with their own format. It's like, it's a big, big jungle that no any other database company actually tapped into. And, and while this didn't make sense before to unify all this infrastructure, now it's like a tipping point because you can actually have machines to do analysis. And the analysis is not just for the sake of, okay, let's get some insights from the data. You can actually come up with deep learning models that can do better cancer detection, let's say from chest X-rays than a human can do. And, and this, if you scale to every specific medical use case, this can have huge impacts on the cross the whole healthcare industry. Um, but you need the data as like one of the biggest components to connect to the models. And that's right. that's where the role we are working with um, large pharma companies to help them with. So I'm asking just the question of, what does it look like when these deep learning models say, fail in these areas? I mean, what does it look like when they succeed? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just get clear about why having a solid data infrastructure before you jump into a machine learning project is so important. And what research could accomplish, researchers, let's say, could accomplish if they had more power over their data sets? So let, let, let me give you an example. As like one of our customers came to us, they're a Fortune 500 med tech company. And they're like, we looked into all available data infra tools. They came to the point that they had a lot of AI projects internally, but the there was not unified altogether. And they're like, hey, we have all this, like we looked into all available tools, including pretty well-known ones in Databricks, et cetera. But no one can actually manage and unify our data storage, especially for like radiology image use cases, where we have many DICOM files or Nifty files, and we have to connect this to the models to come up with better um, AI algorithms that can train this. And one of the reasons that deep learning works is the amount of the data that it can consume and then find the patterns and then build the recognition models. So then later you can use this in production. And what we figured out and the value that we have created for them, this is in their own words. Like we asked them after the successful production pilot and like getting onboarded into them. We said, okay, can you tell us in your own words, what, what are we doing for you? And th what they said was very interesting is that we act like a magical closet for them. They can throw the data on us. We will like somehow, they don't know how, like we'll organize this data so that they can very efficiently retrieve it and connect to the models. And then we ask, okay, why do you need this? And the problem they have mentioned is that they have so many different teams working on AI models and trying to come up with this specific stuff is that some of them like even end up buying the set, two of them buying the same data set from a third party vendor twice. So this third party vendor knew that there's like organization already has the license to use this data set. They did sell the twice, the second time, the same data set, which is... <laughs> I mean, it's a shame on the, <laughs> or unethical sort of from the vendor, but regardless, this is like the problem is that you, within an organization, you really need to access, let's say, um, very specific data set of cancer for, I don't know, for the chest um, X-ray images. And then you want to train this model to be able to solve that highly precise problem. And you need to be able to access this data. And, and the reason why data is very, very critical is like, it's very, very similar to self-driving cars. Um, I don't know if you've seen recently, there was this self-driving um, car Tesla demo by Musk who was um, driving across Palo Alto. And then they were first time demonstrating that you can have a end-to-end -end neural network making the decisions right. on driving the cars. And what they found, and then you you could see that Tesla was not actually stopping at the stop sign, and it was like, and then and then and then there was like question why does it like not stop sign like it's basically it's a rule right it's like it, you have to wait three seconds count one two three and then you leave to go etc. 
And the reason is that because they train this model across maybe the hundred thousands of drivers driving around in Palo Alto. And, and it appears that only very few stop at the stop sign <laughs> and as all of us as drivers. So the neural net network just learns how the drivers work. So being born and raised in California, that's called a California stop, right? <laughs> so you slow, you could just sort of slow down. And yeah, if there's somebody else there, maybe you stop, but otherwise you keep rolling along. So yes, I'm very familiar with that activity. <laughs> So that demonstrates the importance of the versus like what is an average, what is an expectation, and what actually is expected from a model to behave. And the way to tackle the problem the way they did is that they took all the examples that had like stop sign, like actually they stopped at the stop sign. And instead, instead of adding like an if and rule to the neural network saying, hey, if you see a stop sign, you should stop here. They actually went into the data and upsampled those examples that have many, many like people who are dr drivers who are stopping at the stop sign and then counting like, I don't know, three seconds. And then once they had upsampled, so basically when the model was being trained on, it, it started to see more examples of such cases versus the average that you would expect from a human driver. And then the model could behave. And this demonstrates that if you're training a neural network and you want to put this into a very highly like sensitive or critical application, you actually need to take care of what exactly data that's getting to the model. And this becomes right. way more important. I mean, of course, driving cars is like, it's like a super important case. You don't want to make any mistake, but like some minor mistakes are fine. If you are especially in patient care and you are making a diagnosis that like a surgical operation should happen because of this, a decision, you want to be highly, 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 highly critical, careful, and accurate, and like your false positives should be super low, and you have to take care of all the edge cases. And the way you do that is actually you make decisions. What data do you feed into these models? Yeah, I would love to have the discussion about how how accurate these models are versus most humans that are doing the same thing. I think. I think if we actually publish the data of the error rate of humans, the machine would be beating them by Lisa, but we don't have those discussions openly, which is an interesting discussion. So you guys have built this uh, a database at Active Loop that you call DeepLake, if I'm not mistaken, and it's a form of a data lake, right? And so, as a way into talking about deep lake, can you explain what is a data lake? And then we can sort of juxtapose what is what is deep lake. So typically a data lake is a centralized storage where you throw your data onto it. And this was like the original um, form of what people started to refer to a data lake where people like just can store a bunch of data they collect from different sensors or from different data sources and just dump somewhere. So later the organization, whenever the time comes for the business analytics to bring the insights, they can access this data and start processing it. What happened is that people started overusing data lakes and the data lakes became data swamps because it becomes a huge mess on to like organize like how to organize the data where to find it how to like even map it to the need is this the data is correct data or there were some errors and it became a mess to manage for a lot of organizations not only in healthcare but also like across the board and people then came up with a second generation of data lakes which tried to organize it into a form that then you can later both query version control and iterate upon and let me ask you a question though there so when you say that though, how is a data lake different from a regular database then? If you get into the technical terms, then the database need like the mostly it's like it's it's the need is to be able to store the data in memory. And there are different types of databases, first of all. Secondly, most of the databases, they store the data in memory on a machine and they are like highly transactional, which means that you can 
give them um, requests, they will immediately bring back the data. And then they keep the data in a hot memory, which is very expensive, but that's what you need because you need to minimize the latency to be able to access this. And more, more, and another big difference between databases and data lakes is that your database mostly structured, which means it should be in the table form. It should be like, there's like a language SQL, like you should be able to store. If you want to store images, nobody is like ever, ever recommending you to store it inside the database. You likely what you do is like you put it on a data lake and then put a pointer saying in a database that, hey, my data is on, let's say on S3 on AWS, and then try to bring it back whenever you try to access this. And then what you end up with is this huge separation of all your like unstructured data, which is mostly like 95% of the volume that's sitting on a data lake. And then you have maybe five or maybe 1% stored in a database or some table that like kind of acts as a metadata or across all your board. And, and that becomes super inefficient when you are trying to do AI and machine learning model training by consuming this data. And the reason for this is like data scientists, they actually go and run a query on this database, like could be Postgres or Snowflake, create a view, then go and link by link, fetch the images into a machine. So then you can connect to the model and then start doing the AI learning process. And then let's say you want to say the example I brought back, like with the cell driving car use case, now you want to go back and upsample the edge cases that you really care for your medical application. Then you have to do this iteration again, access the database, do that. And it takes a lot of cycles from a data scientist to be able to work with this. So I gave you a trivial example, but like Fortune 500 or 1000 companies, they not only have one data product, they have like order of 200 data products across the board, the different data is stored in different databases, different locations on different data lakes, diff, diff, like that, like the mess is like gets like multiplied or the complexity as you increase the scale of the organization working with a lot of data. And especially like pharma companies, they have been collecting actually data like, like 200 years. Like they're one of the oldest organizations in the world. They have collected this data and some of them are actually storing papers on the like the, the like in, in archive that nobody has ever seen like after like few years and imagine if you can connect all this data that all the clinical trials all the experiments that you have done in the past and make like help you or enable you to make your next decision on which drug to double down on or um, which research to start on and all this information can actually um, help and enable life science companies to make better decisions there. So I, I just want to drill down into this a little more so that everybody sort of, you know, gets a picture of this is, you know, what are the shortcomings of where you were talking about, you know, these traditional data lakes when it comes to handling the data needed, say, to train and operate these deep learning models. I mean, are there specific varieties of data that data lakes aren't good at storing or moving around? Um, or is there, or is it just the sheer volume you were talking about that needs to be moving around that that's the problem? Or, you know, are data lakes just bad at storing, uh, and I'm picking on these three things, images, video, and audio, because I know that that's something you guys focus on, or is there, or other types of data um, to to train uh, a deep learning model. So where where are the big issues with using the traditional data lake approach? Yeah, that, that that's thanks for bringing it up. It's like basically it's about the abstractions, and th what I mean by abstractions is like data lakes are so good they don't take any assumptions on the data, and if you don't take any assumption of the data, you treat everything as a blob. As like, yeah, here's like some one box, another box, another box. You don't really care what's inside the box. And when you don't really care what's inside the box, it makes it like very easy to throw everything inside. But then being able to know what's there and what you need to access it, that becomes a problem. And that's where deep lake comes in. It's it's not only saying, hey, um, give me all, all, every type of a box that you have. It's It says like, hey, now I can actually know what's the shape of the box. I know 
how it should I actually take this box and then put it into smaller pieces or combine it into larger boxes and then store it in, in the closet. I know how to connect this to the models. I know how to be able to query the data. So the second generation of the data lakes, especially deep lake, which comes with a big differentiation that it can actually store not only tabular data, but also images, video, audio, text, DICOM files, nifty files, like, I don't know, DNA sequences, all this information that's super critical for healthcare industry to be able to operate in an AI native format that becomes trivial to connect to the both AI models and also to the humans so that they can visualize or see see what the data structure is. So, and that, that's one way to get out of these data swamps by being able not only like treat them as blobs, but also know their form, their shape, and how to actually maneuver or manipulate that data to connect this to the models. And that's where actually 80% of the data scientist time is spent on is building these data pipelines to connect the data to the models. And that's where we take a big cut. Off. So is Deep Lake, does it use a different storage format from other databases on, um, you know, or uh, what I'll call older forms of a, of a data lake. I mean, I, if I, re I was reading that you're using, that it's a tensor data that is considered native to Deep Lake um, in a way that wouldn't be on, say, an older storage system. So is that, am I thinking about that correctly? Yeah, totally. Um, so if you look into how um, deep learning models operate, especially let's say GPT-4, the large language models or the foundational models, is that they don't really take care if you're giving it as an image or video or an audio file. They What they operate on is tensors. And what are tensors? They are n-dimensional arrays. So now, instead of having a data lake that can store any blob or like any binary data, you can actually shape them into this, what I was mentioning, like n-dimensional boxes so that they become very easy for an AI model to compre comprehend. You can take that box and then directly ship this to the model. The model will, doesn't have to do any transfer, additional transformation to be able to consume it. And that, that gives us the biggest differentiator is that the way we have said this is like, okay, let us understand how this data is going to be consumed. And there's no free lunch in databases. Like if you all optimize it for AI workloads, then it becomes sort of bad for analytical workloads. If you optimize for analytical workloads, then it becomes bad for AI workloads. As new, like if you look into the history of databases, is that every era of new innovation creates new types of databases. And like in, in dot com era, where you got a lot of JSON files for web development, you got companies like, or databases like MongoDB. So you can store all your documents and then easily retrieve it. And this became a, like a huge company. Then during mobile era, um, you got a lot of analytical data, like events that can co you collect for understanding how each user is um, doing behavior and let's say what to recommend to this user. And that's why you got like data warehouses, for example, Snowflake, that can process this huge amount of the data. And the way they operate on top of the data sets is also totally different. And so let, let me ask you a specific question. So let, let's... I'm trying to uh, see if you can give me a couple of examples or why say queries are easier to run on this tensor formatted data. You know, can you give a specific example, let's say from health or biomedicine? Yes. So let's say do you take the traditional data lakes and usually there's like this fa famous known format called parquet. You put into parquet not only the metadata, let's say you collect from the electronic record files for the patient, but also now you're saying, okay, now I have this bunch of DICOM files. What if I put this into the Parquet file format? And Parquet is like great for analytical workloads. On top of that, you have this famous data lakes like called 2 d Iceberg Delta Lake that connect then to your ecosystem for the queries, et cetera. And you can run like pretty cost efficient queries on top, but they're mostly good for asking this type of like, okay, what was my sales activity for the last three months? Or how many patients did you have? Did I had that had this specific, let's say, cancer for um, last um, um, week? But then once you say, okay, now I want to take all the DICOM images that the CT scans or the MRI scans have collected so far, 
and I want to look into them. If you put this data separately, then you are doing what you what people have been doing so far is like just linking from the data lake to another blob storage file that nobody cares. If you decide, let's say, and there were companies who actually decided, oh, we're going to create a new format. We're going to extend parquet files and put the DICOM files inside <laughs> parquet files. But then these parquet files became so big that even running the queries became very inefficient. And not only that, also like the, when you train a, let's say an AI model, you actually need a special type of access pattern. And what this access pattern is, is being able to shuffle the data randomly before you fit this to the model. So then your model is not biased towards the first examples that you have seen and can like randomly um, train train the model. And yep. what, what, and what DeepLake actually did is like, we came up with a tensor storage format to satisfy these two constraints. First, we can actually store both the metadata and the data itself within the same, what we call data sets, think of them as tables. And then we have this co column isolation, which means that each column is stored separately. And instead of having one dimensional columns where you can't, I mean, technically you can do that, but that blows the memory off, is that now we can have N dimensional columns. So your CT scans or MRI scans can actually stack together into a single column with their corresponding dimensions and efficiently be stored on top of a um, blob storage. And why this is important is that once your AI model is gonna access this, it's gonna get the data in the shape that it expects to consume to train the model itself. And, but at the same time, you can actually run a query, shuffle the data randomly and bring it back. For example, the traditional analytical data sets, they don't have the random access. For you to go and access the middle of the data, you have to actually go and read from the first item till the middle one. So then you can mm -hmm. then you can get the middle one. But if you're going to randomly shuffle and then access the data, this becomes a big bottleneck for your train models on top. And that's where DeepLake becomes very um, efficient for your AI workloads to be able both to train and store this data and then connect this to the models. So I was reading one of the white papers that I saw on Deep Lake, and it, it, you, you seem to focus on several features that you guys think are particularly important. Um, I don't know, maybe you could walk us through, you know, why they're important and why they work better in this format of Deep Lake. I mean, you talk about version control, which I get, visualization, querying, um, materialization, and then streaming. So those seem to be the five areas that you have highlighted in the white paper. Uh, you know, why are they important and why do they work better in the approach you guys have? Well, I think that the part of the diagram that you're referring to it is basically this whole active learning loop where a company, like training a one-time model doesn't really make sense much. If you are building your own AI um, initiative, you actually really care about fast AI iterations. And mm -hmm. to be fully iterate with that, you act, you need to be able to con version control the data so you can version control the experiments later. You want to be able to query the data to, so that you can sub-select sub the necessary information there. You want to be able to um, like then run queries on top being able to materialize materializes the step where it may if your query is sparse you might decide to copy it and compact the data set and then so you can be able to very efficiently stream this to the training process so that's like half of actually the ai loop that you have to take care of. and then there are other parts that you have to train you have to evaluate you have to um, deploy these models you also have the annotation side of things so what DeepLake is taking care of is all the data management related activities that you have to not worry about because you spend like, this is like, this is the most boring piece in the, the whole steps. Everyone wants to train a model. Everyone is like super excited, like trying the GPT force and see how it goes with the specific data, but nobody really wants to take care of like how, how, how to properly store and manage the data sets. And that's, that's how, that's our philosophy is like, yeah, the, you guys focus on the most core important thing, give us the boring job and we'll take care of the data 
uh, management layer. And then what we have seen as well across our customers is that if you don't have, if you just directly work off on top of a data lake, like an engineer or data scientist, they come up with this custom scripts that be able to extract the data from the like traditional data lake and ship this to the model. After two months, not only he is not able to share that script with another person so that another person can reproduce the experiment, he himself or she himself herself cannot be able is not able to understand what was the script about because the ai changed the model changed the experiments changed and i think that's one of the critical infrastructure pieces that deep lake provides is this version control that gives you a full data lineage on how the data has been originally collected till how it has been transformed before it was fed to the model piece and unfortunately, I know that there has been a lot of attempts, but there's no any fully um, database, data lake, lake house infrastructure that actually captures that part of the code to be able to really track the experience. And this becomes very critical down the Lord. You you know better than me is like on the like the, when you go through the clinical trials and like especially on the models this. This is going to be the more, one of the most critical in, inspection pieces. Like, what, not only you need the model and the accuracy metrics, but also what the data has been stored on, and what are the biases and the analytics on top of this that you can like, you can do. And one of the key things that we took the architecture differently than any other database is that it's like serverless is embedded. While for some applications or for technical people, like it sounds cool, what actually is really useful is that the data stores on our customer cloud or on-premise obviously we don't have access to this data but more than that both the visualization and the streaming and all the functionality runs embedded within customer site which means that let's say if you open your browser you go to active today and you connect to your data set the data set directly streams from your client browser to the storage that you own. It doesn't fly through our servers. It doesn't come through this. And the same thing is happening when you train a model, you train directly streaming from the data, from the storage to the GPU models. And this gives you, um, and this like enabled us so many to bypass so many like infosec reviews. And because the data is stored within our customer premises and whenever their users or scientists like access this data, it's their client who like gets authorized through us, but then the, fetches the data from their storage to their premises. And this is also one of the critical pieces that's overlooked, especially when you manage the data. So let's jump back to the company just for a minute, right? Um, you're one of the founders. Who else was involved in this? I guess the founders and designers of Deep Lake and what backgrounds did they come from? Yeah, we, we have a, actually a great team. I'm super proud of and excited to be working with. Um, we have um, our head of product, Evo, who did a PhD at Stanford in mechanical engineering, then uh, worked a few years at Tesla, then um, started his own computer vision company. And that's where he realized all these data problems are big bottleneck to succeed. So he joined us to head the product. Uh, we have um, Dadovic, she's our chief operating officer. She's like overseeing all the operations within the company previously was the chief data officer at a gaming company managing of um, over 500 employees um and she also did math in Zurich university where she, like that's like the data and and the math are super super correlated with each other and then we have mikhail who is on the marketing front although he has he has the highest number of papers published in nature especially on the psychometric sites and the how the fake news spread over the networks um, before joining the company, he was at UNC Chapel Hill. And then um, before that, he also an internship at Google launching YouTube music there. And we also have a um, super bright engineering team from Armenia who is like building this database with an experience of um, chip design companies, like working at Xilinx or Synopsys, where they realize all these low level items, how the data is like, like you, you, basically if you build a database, you have to understand how that works on the hardware or metal level and then start mm -hmm. up on that and we also do have team members from um previously who worked at oracle um companies like that and are all built like widely open source um database infrastructure pieces um and all this like helps us to 
um, both the understanding of how the hardware works, how the databases, traditional databases work, and how actually the AI needs are evolving uh, moving forward. So you guys, if I'm not mistaken, you guys also participated in Y Combinator back in 2018, right? Correct, yes. Um, so we actually, during YC, we we, we got formed. Um, like we started the company. We thought like, oh, hey, like let's try to apply to YC and see what happens out of it. And apparently we thought of an internship. I talked to my advisors like, yeah, just try it out. It doesn't work, you'll be back. And we, we went to YC and um, I stayed within the company for the last six, six years. And like what happened is like three years later, I got an email from my advisors, like any decision. And I was like, well, clueless cool, what's going on. And like opened up the forward is like our graduate school pinging the computer science department, if I'm coming back or not. Then they're like playing this ping pong is like asking if we're not sure who knows that. And then one of was like, oh, let us ask his advisor. And then they ping Sebastian. Sebastian is like, he was on sabbatical at the time as well. I was like, yeah, just ask him directly. And this is like one of my regretful decisions that I've ever made. Um, I've thought a lot, a lot about this. Like I really wanted to finish uh, my PhD. I really wanted to build um, like a kind of academic path or career. But then what I also like, I talked to other professors at Princeton and one of the key advice is like, yes, you can do both at the same time, but you won't be good at it. So just pick one and then double down on it and make this happen. And if that doesn't work out, you can always be back. And I think that email that I mentioned, the any decision email, actually helped me to like kind of retrospectively review what I'm doing. And I figured out that I can have much bigger in impact on computer science and all the adjustment industries while working at this company than, than going and finishing my PhD. Yeah, don't worry. Every once in a while, I threaten my family that I'm going to go back and get a PhD. So um, <laughs> just, just, just in case everything else doesn't work out or I get bored or something. <laughs> so, um, but let me, let me ask a question. Like, Back in 2018, was the need for a deep learning optimized database like clear? Not at all. No, like we were talking to so many people. It's like, hey, we are building a database for AI. Do you like? Do you need? need do you need one? It's like, why? Why do I need an, another database? Like, <laughs> why do I care? And things literally changed a, a year ago because of the just like the. OpenAI releasing GPT-4, all the hype and wave, et cetera, people now realized, oh, wait a second, we have now new types <laughs> of data to process, including vectors and embeddings. Where are we going to start this? The traditional databases do not support it, even though later everyone added support for vectors. The new, um, like the data lakes don't support this at all. Like, what are we going to do? And you can see, like, if you look into our downloads charts, like in one day, our downloads increased seven, eight times, just because Gen AI developers, which is another new term for like you had web developers, now you have Gen AI developers, um, started using Deep Lake as a vector store to be able to process the data. And now like the market dynamics totally changed as well. I think looking in hindsight, what was sort of our bet like about five years ago is that AI is going to be big. We knew that. I mean, everyone knew that like for the last, I don't know, 70 years, but when this will happen, nobody knew. <laughs> but then what was the missing piece is that like there was no actually data storage for AI. And the way data scientists worked is was the, exactly the same way as you open your laptop and move around folders um, across the state. So, and th th this hasn't been the case for traditional um, databases so far, like like in web development, you, you got all the infrastructure related for you to be able to manage this. And, and that's where we said, okay, why don't we actually go and build a database for AI before it was cool? And it takes 10 years to build the database and we are still in the middle of it. The, 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 the funny part, I, I, I would always say something like, you know, luck is a very important thing when you're in a startup, like that moment of timing and things just, which you have no control over. Sorry, like you can't, you couldn't have changed open AI doing whatever they're doing and causing this big shift, but you know what? It works to the... You were right at the right place and it just happened to come together at the right time. The, the way maybe it's like too romantic or naive to think of is that actually like in expectation in average, like in no, no any startup, including us should survive. Like you like by default, you're going to die. That's like the default for st starting a company. And then there's all 
like this one percentile of luck or chance that you're going to succeed. And you as a founder role or as a company role, is like you bet on this one percentile, but not only you bet, but you also do everything to bend that one percentage. And I think that's what differentiates like not just betting, like it's an uncontrollable process, but you are inside of that one percentile bet and you have to make sure that that, that gets, the path has been chosen like that to, to get there. Yeah, I mean, we only talk about the, you only hear about the ones that succeed. You never hear about the other 99% that fail. So um, that's why it's so romantic to start a company. Um, but, okay. So I was reading of, of the blog on the website about, the team at Google Brain that developed a convolution, convolutional neural network called uh, Efficient Net, uh, which they used to analyze retinal images for evidence of diabetic retinopathy. I mean, can you walk us through that story and how Deep Lake helps with this kind of application? Yeah, so the key issue is there is like when you collect all the images that you have to store there and then connect to the models is that the, the you have two parts, right? You have to construct the architecture of the model. Should you choose mm -hmm. like efficient net or dense net, or you can also choose like more traditional ones that are like, by the way, whole deep learning revolution, at least the second wave started with, because of the Alex net. And then there were multiple iterations and where that's where the efficient net came into the place. And then once the Alex net was um, created, the um, Google actually acquired like um, Alex Krzyzewski's Ilya Sudskevers, who, who was the chief scientist of OpenAI, and then jo Geoffrey Hinton, who is one of the founding fathers of deep learning to the Google brain, is that then that's where a lot of things started to happen in 2012. And I was doing my PhD in 2016, so it's like four years after that event, a single event had happened. Um, and when you collect, like when you start collecting a lot of data, for um, training those deep learning models. The key thing there is to be able to structure in a form that you can con connect to the like PyTorch or TensorFlow to do, the, to do the training process. But not only on that, but also you can go and start um, experimenting what kind of model architecture I can choose for. And apparently what, what people figured out is that applying efficient net, which not only takes a convolutional neural network and then naively applies across, you can actually like make it in a sparse way that the neural network is constrained to find these missing connections and only preserving the the most important missing connections for you to be able to in a highly accurate manner to be able to um, classify what the disease like from the retinal images you can get from. Um, and then what later happened is that this art, new architecture called transformers they are essentially doing a tension-based model that can, given the data, it can decide where to focus on this data and then retrieve that information. So, um, but then that's like kind of predecessor of the transformers, the efficient net um, in, in that, within that regard. And it's very also similar in biomedical image use cases. You have other types of models such as like UNET or dense net, sorry, um, units, there's also like some variations of 3D units, et cetera. So they can consume a lot of biomedical data. And the way they do that is they um, basically take different layers of information and then try to downsample and preserve the most compact, like high level information and then keep it as a hierarchy and then, then expand back by having the skip connections between the first layers of the low resolution to the higher resolution and and then preserving both the high level details and the low level details and that like what like let me take a step back like there's this theory that you can take any two layer neural network and then map any function but that's not helpful because you actually want to embed the model of the world into the right. model itself and why the data is there is is important is that like it really helps you like you, you have a data set, you don't know the best architecture, but you need to like quickly be able to iterate across all the different variations of the experience that you run. And that's the role of the AI researcher is to come up with the next best model that can do. And that's what happened because of the AlexNet, because of the um, transfers, et cetera. And then for you to be able to do that, 
fast cycles, you need just good data infrastructure to be able to store the data. Um, yeah, I think that's that's within that use case. I do remember the um, deep lake importance was to be able to structure correctly in the form that an AI model will consume and then take it from there. So how does the business model work? I mean, you touched on it, I mean, you were talking about it being on-premises and so forth, but I'm trying to figure out, is it a SaaS model? Is it a, you know, that you sell on a subscription base? Does, how, how, are you, how are you monetizing what you're doing? Yeah, it's, it's based on the usage. It's user-based pricing, basically how much data you store with us and we manage for you, and that's how we monetize. It's like as simple as that. There are like much more complicated models for database companies based on how many number of queries or compute do you consume. We take a very naive and simple approach that our customers do appreciate. And it's like, it's depending on the volume of the data. Okay. And then, I don't know, who do you think about as like a competitor? I mean, Netflix says its main competitor is sleep. So who, who would your competitors be old fashioned databases or is it some other types of organizations like maybe, maybe Google, Amazon, Microsoft, I don't know. No, they are more like our partners at this moment and few other databases as well, like our partners, especially not in this field. When we talk to the customers and we ask them about the alternatives, they're like mostly fighting with files. So the way they currently, most of these organizations run their data management is like, you will be surprised. You have like a huge pharma tech company putting data in a Dropbox, bunch of DICOM files. This is like, and this is now, I mean, Dropbox is a great product, but it's for consumers <laughs> for storing your personal family photos and then accessing it later. It's not designed yeah. for you to like put it on, I don't know, or, or in a Google Drive. That's what we are like being surprised over time and time again. We're seeing how these people manage it. And you can't blame them as well. It's like, that just worked out. Okay, great. We move forward. Let's go and solve our next bottleneck. Um, that's what we have seen the biggest, um, like kind of, okay, we have to go and change the way they think about their data and how do they consume it. So what's the intellectual or technological moat, special sauce or IP protection that you guys have that, that gives you this, you know, special place mm -hmm. obviously we do have patents we did publish a paper at a top database conference we have our own obstructions that are on the tensor storage level we have one of the best data loaders that can stream the data from the storage to the gpus as if the data is local to the machine think of this like netflix for data sets um, we have a proprietary visualization engine that like directly streams the data from storage to the browser which is um, like not there, like you usually typically have another backend that does a rendering, etc. So we have all these technological pieces, but like my, myself, uh, I am myself, like I don't believe into technical technology mods and that like sooner or later, people are going to catch up on this front. And then, and starting from, um, like, oh, like hundred years ago, when people were building like airplanes, you come up with an best engine and people just switch to you. And the same thing you are seeing with the model AI models as well. Like every day there's like one new model that's launched with 1% more accuracy and their graphs is changing. Okay, everyone is like switching from this one to another one. I think what we really um, focus on is like creating the value for our customers and taking away the boring job that they have to, they don't want to do. And that's where uh, it becomes super attractive for us um, to help them with managing their data sets. And the way the architecture works as well, that makes it like pass all the necessary security requirements for large either med tech or um, life science data storing the PIA information inside deep lake in production. Um, and this like gives us a big differentiator across other available tools. Aside from like, yes, we can also store the, the DICOM files with CT scans or the MRI scans and then connect to your radiology use cases or we can like really like in matter of hours index all the PubMed data and store that inside a separate deep lake data so they can like run very fast queries on top and then bring this back to your application that you're building like a knowledge base across your your site. So those are like the like in a very simple and naive, but those are like the engineers or 
data scientist stuff. I think the key thing is that, hey, we have proven uh, with many um, top um, Fortune 500, both pharma and med tech in healthcare industry companies, that this actually provides a lot of value for managing the data and organizing it so that you can be way more efficient bringing AI into um, coming up with the next drug or coming up with the next equipment as will be deployed in a hospital and which are like really where the most of the value is and those like the the data and the ai they are just tools for now like to make it more efficient to get there david it's been great having you on the show um hopefully i didn't like pelt you with too many different questions to try to get to the bottom of things but uh I wish you guys success. I mean, the most important thing for me is always seeing these products get to market and then move faster because I'm not getting any younger. And the more innovation that comes into the world, the, the healthier, happier I'll be. Thank you very much, Harry, for having me. And all all questions were pretty good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Took me Excellent. a while to think of what how to answer that. So great to, <laughs> great to be here. And thanks, thanks for having me. Thank you.